Hello and welcome back to another quick book look. Today we're going to be looking at Murder by the Book by Claire Harmon. Uh, this novel is about Charles Dickens, Queen Victoria, and the question of whether or not a novel can kill. Chapter 1, A Last Walk. At 6 o'clock on the evening of 5th of May, 1840, a spare old gentleman of medium height and distinguished but unshowy appearance could have been seen walking a large white dog along Norfolk Street in Mayfair, just a few yards away from Hyde's Park northeast corner. He didn't go far, nor proceed very fast. Lord William Russell was asthmatic and suffered from a hernia that made walking difficult. He was heading towards a house just off Grosvenor Square to combine a message for an upholster, Mr. Barry, with his routine airing before dinner. He was not in the best of moods, having had to reprimand his valet an hour earlier for forgetting to send the carriage to the club. What use was keeping a carriage if you had to come home in a hackney cab? The whole business of maintaining an address in London was bothersome, much more trouble than the old life of moving from place to place on the continent, living for long periods in the houses of friends or rel relations, or staying in hotels. But his traveling days were over. I feel too old, he told his nephew three years earlier, and have at last made up to set down quietly in London like an old hack, turned out to grass for life. The place where he had settled, a terrace, how, terrace, <clears throat> the place where he had settled a terraced townhouse at 14 Norfolk Street, was a far cry from Woburn Abbey, the family home of the Russells, where Lord William had been brought up and where, until his death in 1839, his elder brother John had kept one of the most splendid private residences in the country after the Queen's. John's son, Francis, had now succeeded to the dukedom and the grand estate, and position in the family had shifted once more, pushing Lord William a little further from the center of power and money. Grandson of one duke, brother to the next two, and uncle to the latest, Lord William was doomed to be a satellite male in a family well provided with heirs, and as such, of small fortune and no importance. Even his name seemed to belong to him a little less as the years went by, and he was now referred to as Old Lord William to distinguish him from his nephew, a well-known diplomat. There had been advantages, of course, to existing on the perimeters of a great and powerful clan, as long as he didn't develop outrageous habits and run up disproportionate debts. Lord William had always been protected by family cash and welcomed at the Dussel home. Family patronage assured him the seat in Parliament that he held for four elections from the age of 22, but it was just as well that his charming bride, Charlotte Villiers, eldest daughter of the Earl of Jersey, had had a fortune of her own. They married in the year of the French Revolution, 1789, and lived abroad for much of the time, in Italy, Germany, and Switzerland. Lady Charlotte bore him, bore him seven children, four boys, and three girls, and her death in 1808, aged 37, stunned him. In the long decades since, Lord William always kept a miniature portrait of her painted on ivory in his dressing case, and until a few weeks previously had carried on his person at all times a gold locket containing a strand of his dead wife's hair. The loss, of, the loss of this locket on a recent visit to Richmond had upset the old man greatly. It had been his most treasured possession. In the 30 years since Lady Charlotte's death, his habits had become increasingly solitary. He traveled a lot, studied artworks, and advised his brother on which sculptures and paintings to buy for the seemingly endless halls of Warburn. His fine family might have been a comfort to him, but three of his four sons died young, the second eldest, Captain George Russell R.N., died of fever in the West Indies in 1825. The eldest, Francis, a promising soldier, became addicted to gambling, ending an inglorious life as the sixth duke lamented along race course ruffians in 1832. And John, the third son, a commander in the Navy, died on active service three years later. Of his three daughters, one died in infancy, and his eldest child, Gertrude, lived abroad under the shadow of chronic illness a little deranged, the Prime Minister, Lord Melbourne, thought. Thus, of Lord William's seven offspring, only two remained close by. His younger daughter, Eliza, who had been brought up at Woburn by her uncle and aunt and had married her cousin, and his only remaining son, Mr. William Russell, 
Attorney General of the Duchy of Lancaster, known as Councillor William in the family. Lord William's eccentricities and absent-mindedness were often remarked on, and as he made his way towards Grosvenor Square on his evening walk, he was very likely talking to himself or the dog. One of the servants had called him a rum old chap recently, and it was true. When he lived abroad and heard that the younger Brussels were likely to visit, he typically went somewhere else, happy to be rattling round Europe alone in his post chaise, which I have for very many years found a very pleasant home, and I am thankful for it as it has furnished me opportunity for reflection and philosophy. He was most at home these days at his clubs, Brooks on St. James Street and the Travelers on Pall Mall, and seldom entertained in Norfolk Street. His servants must have got used to it being a quiet and predictable place, with Lord William alone in the study among his prints and paintings, the clock ticking and the fire waxing and waning. It was all too quiet for the cook, Mary Hannell, who had recently given notice, desiring a change. She was going to forget how to do her job, she said, if she stayed any longer with his lordship. Why Lord William had spent so many of his 72 years abroad is not entirely clear. The continent was the usual refuge for those who had fallen on hard times or were evading their creditors. It was also a place where one could sit out a scandal. Any of those reasons could have held true for Lord William in a period of his life which he looked back on as abundantly full of vexation. Florence, Rome, Bologna, Leghorn, Geneva, Paris, we see him flitting through other people's letters and journals in the 1820s and 1830s, staying in hotels or more frequently at someone else's house. Lady Hardy's or the Abercorns, the Payne Galway's or the Fitzclarence's, or being gathered into the Earl and Countess of Blessington's circle when that notorious circus arrived in Genoa. It comes as a surprise to find that this eccentric solitary took part enthusiastically in masquerade balls and made an impressive Sir Peter Teal's The Plum Part in an amateur production of School for Scandal put on at Lord Burgish in the summer of 1823, in which Lady Hardly played Miss, Mrs. Candor. I have heard that he acted very well and that you looked very well, Byron teased her. Lady Hardy, the wife of Nelson's right-hand man at Trafalgar, was one of Lord William's more observant friends, noting his old-fashioned gallantry towards her and Lady Westmoreland and his habit, habit of buttonholing people at parties. She thought him as odd and absent as ever in 1825, and on an excursion to Chamonix, he amused and slightly disconcerted the ladies present by jumping and hopping about like the boys who were with us. He took off his coat and capered about in his waistcoat, holding his staff to jump over the crevasses. Lady Hardy didn't consider Lord William the remarrying type and noticed more than he might have wished. When he was visiting her in Lausanne in September 1822, he had developed the peculiar habit of putting his watch in his mouth as he paced up and down the room. One morning, he announced that he had lost this watch and suspected his man's servant of having stolen it, which Lady Hardy tried to persuade him was unlikely, the servant being a highly respectable one. You swallowed it in one of your absent fits, she said as a joke, at which Lord William stopped and said, Do you really think so? It is possible. Most certainly it was not, Lady Hardy, Hardy wrote tartly in her diary, as it had a gold chain and seal attached to it, which never could have got down his throat even if his huge watch had. She made some discreet inquiries via the servants as to where Lord William might have mislaid his watch and discovered that he had recently taken several warm baths at a questionable establishment in the city of Lausanne, where it was not advisable for ladies to go. This was undoubtedly where he and the timepiece had parted company, she concluded. Were such questionable establishment Lord William's frequent haunts? In his diary of 1829, his nephew William, who was fond of him, lamented Uncle Bill's strange mode of life, neither respectable nor useful, and to Lady Holland described him as an unhappy wandering spirit who wandered about from tavern to tavern without knowing why or wherefore. There seems something unacknowledged here, either a temperamental quirk or a vice. Lord William's private life necessarily remains private, but one possible cause of the vexation which propelled him and his wife abroad in 1807 might perhaps be detected in a piece of gossip 
passed on to the teenage Queen Victoria in the first year of her reign by her confidant and mentor, Lord Melbourne. The late Lady William Russell, Melbourne told Victoria, had a great connection and friendship with the Duke of Argyle. She was sister to the Duchess of Argyle, the Queen recorded in her diary, but Lord M said he didn't marry the latter till Lady William died. This is tantamount to saying that Lady William and the Duke had been lovers, though the situation may have been even more complicated than that, since Argyle's wife after 1810, Lady William's sister Caroline, had to divorce her husband, William Paget, in order to marry him, so the Duke may have been involved with both married Villiers sisters simultaneously. It would partly account for what Elizabeth Wynne wrote in her diary in 1807 in a very rare glimpse of the married life of Lord William and Lady Charlotte, when she related how she had spent a pleasant evening at Lady William Russell's with the Duke of Argyle and a Mrs. Page, presumably Mrs. Paget, the only other guests. Lord William was present too, of course. Wynne noted but added the significant phrase, Coquille me pare un zero dans les maisons. In other words, it appears to her that Lord William counted for nothing in his own household, a cuckold in spirit if not in fact. But the question remains, was he deliberately turning a blind eye to his wife's great connection and friendship with Argyle, or was he the kind of cuckold who hadn't even noticed anything going on? On his walk to Grosvenor Square, Lord William turned from Green Street into Park Street, avoiding the unpaved mews and rows connecting the residential blocks where all the routine maintenance of Mayfair life went on and where, cheek by jowl with the gentry, you could find plumbers, plasterers, pole dealers, carpenters, wheelwrights, and vets. Along North Row, adjacent to Norfolk Street, the nature of the trades seemed to change gradually west to east, from the city of Norwich, public house at the corner, past a shoemaker, a grocery shop, and two livery stables. One, Shenton's, where Lord Williams kept his carriage and where the dog went to sleep at night. Past a tailor and hairdresser to some less genteel businesses at the eastern end of the lane, a beer shop, a corn dealer, a bottle shop, and a ragman. Walking along, Park Street took him past the house of his friend, Lady Julia Lockwood, Lady Abercorn's sister, and a close associate of Lady Hardy. She had recently helped Lord William out of a domestic difficulty when his trusted valet, an Englishman called James Ellis, gave notice to go and work for the Earl of Mansfield. Lord William complained about this to Lady Julia, and she told him that a former footman of hers, a young Swiss, was on the lookout for a new position. Lord William wrote to the boy's employer, John Menet Fector, MP for Maidstone, and the deal was soon done. Lord William saved some money by getting a junior servant on a probationary salary, and the footman got a promotion, a significant raise, and a move to central London. There seems to have been something of a vogue for Swiss servants at the time. Difficult employment conditions in their homeland in the years following the disbanding of the National Army were perhaps encouraging Swiss workers to migrate, and English middle and upper class households at this date were insatiably hungry for domestic staff. In Lord William's circle, the Swiss were liked for being cheap, clean, and reliable. Sir Robert Adair had a Swiss servant, as did Lady Hardy, and Lady Julia had two, Henri Pitau and his wife Jean, who had both known Mr. Fector's boy since his arrival in England four years earlier were, and were friends with his uncle, both were called Corvoisers, now butler to Sir Robert Baumont. The hiring and keeping of servants was a constant topic of concern among the circles in which Lord William lived and moved. Turnover rates were high, disasters frequent, and employers got used to being constantly on the lookout for good recommendations from friends. When Lord William was about to go traveling in 1831, he inquired of his nephew William about a stupid old Swiss called Giradet, whom they had in service the year before, and subsequently took him on. It worked out fairly well while the two were on the road. Giradet proved a very comforting nurse during a chest infection. But in England, Lord William found him absolutely useless of more plague than profit. He wished he had kept the intelligent and honest German he'd had the year before, though his culpable shortcomings had been a rough and unfeeling manner. Lord William, it seems, was quite hard to please on this score. The new boy, Francois Corvoisier, who was coming from a large and lavish establishment near Dover, may not have understood how much was included in the job of manservant in a small household such as Lord William's, with responsibility for maintaining his master's wardrobe, brushing clothes and hats, 
helping him shave, dress and undress, attending to his hair, polishing boots and shoes, and keeping all his accessories clean and ready to wear. The valet at Norfolk Street also had the duties of a butler and was expected to serve his master's meals and keep the silver polished. In addition, as the only male domestic, he would inevitably be called on to do small handyman tasks all the time and the heavy lifting of coals and water. A valet also needed to have excellent powers of understanding and discretion, and the Swiss boy was neither very well educated nor a very sophisticated speaker of English. A decade later, in her best-selling book on household management, Isabella Beaton identified the pitfalls when trying to get such services on the cheap, saying that while valets were given the responsibility of being the confidants and agents of their master's most unguarded moments of their most secret habits, the servants themselves were rarely equal to the task, being subject to erring judgment aggravated by the imperfect education. But these considerations were overlooked when Lord William acquired his new valet on the 1st of April. What a pity that the boy was too stupid to remember all his messages, necessitating this extra call to the upholsterer. He crossed Grosvenor Square to the southeast corner and rang the bell at 1st Charles Street, where he asked Mr. Barry to wait on him at, at home as soon as possible. Then Lord William turned around and set off immediately back to Norfolk Street. The dog must have been disappointed. It was a pleasant late spring evening when they got home, with the sun lighting the window boxes on the first floor, which were full of geraniums and fragrant mignettes. 14 Norfolk Street was typically early 19th century London townhouse, with three main stories and a narrow frontage about 15 feet. The front door led into passages off which was a dining room at the front and a cloakroom beyond it, with a water closet beyond that. Through a half-glazed back door, a flight of external steps took you down into the yard. On the first floor, there was a drawing room at the front overlooking the street, and behind that, a small sitting room or study. Lord William's bedroom was at the front of the next floor up with an unused spare room connected to it, and up the attic stairs, sealed off with the door, were the servants' bedrooms, the maid and cook sharing the room at the front with the lumber room connected to it, and the valet on his own in a small and rather cramped chamber at the back. Outside at the front of the house, a gated railing and steps led down to the area where you'd enter the kitchen, scullery, and butler's pantry. There was a back door from the pantry into the yard, which had high walls on each side and abutted other properties in each direction. It was a house full of pictures and small antiquities. Lord William's latest acquisition had been a print titled The Vision of Ezekiel that he had bought from Multinos in Pall Mall just the previous week. Elias, his former valet, who could be trusted with such a task, had come by especially to hang it the previous day, and the small stepladder he had used was still in the yard, waiting to be put away. Lord William went upstairs to change for dinner, and when Mr. Barry arrived a few minutes later, he was asked to wait in the dining room. Presently, Barry heard the big dog's footstep preceding his master down the stairs. I left him in good health and spirits with the dog, the tradesman said later, believing he was probably the last person apart from the servants of the house to see Lord William alive. Lord William dined alone as usual at seven and spent the evening in his study on the first floor reading the newly published memoirs of Sir Samuel Romilly, the Whig legal reformer who was, whom he had known. William York, the coachman, came to the house a little before nine to fetch the dog back to the livery stables on North Row and the valet and maid supped together in the kitchen just after that. The cook, Mary Hannell, had gone out for the evening to see a friend, but on her return, she came to the front door, not the servant's entrance, and the valet who let her in confirmed that he had locked, chained, and bolted that door as usual afterwards. The first of the servants to go up to bed was Sarah Manser, the maid, who saw the light on under the door of the room where his lordship was reading. Her last job of the day was to light a fire in his bedroom, as he always had one, and a warming pan, which it was the valet's duty to provide, even in summer. All those years in Southern Europe must have made Lord William particularly sensitive to the cold and damp of London. She placed a thin rushlight ready by his bed and went on up to the room in the attic that she shared with the cook. Lord William's door was vase covered and had a spring on it which made it close, its, close of itself without a noise. The bell hanger's man had just mended the door handle and earlier in the day the bell pole over the bed had also been fixed. The cook had her supper of cold meat and beer and went up to bed about half an hour later, possibly a little the worse for drink, as she slept extremely heavily that night. She had left the fire burning in the kitchen and some extra coals alongside the warming pan. 
At about 11.50 p.m., the bell rang from the study. Lord William was going up to bed late as ever. The valet filled the warming pan with hot coals from the pantry fire and took it up to the bedroom. He helped his master to bed, lit the rushlight, and also, as his lordship's request, a candle so that he could carry on reading. Though there was a key on the inside of the door, his lordship never locked it. Everything in the chamber was as it should be. The valet went to bed. The street was quiet. Two Metropolitan Police Constables, Alfred Slade and George Glue, passed along it several times during the night, one on each side, and reported nothing unusual. The smart new peelers had taken over some of the duties of the old street keepers, and so as he passed 14 Norfolk Street, Glue tested the front door and was later able to confirm it had been locked. But in the middle of the night, two of the neighbors were alerted to something unusual going on. At around 2 a.m., Louisa and Struther, the merry daughter of Lord William's immediate neighbor, Sir Howard Elphinstone, heard something through the bedroom wall that adjoined her own room, a groan or cry. She thought no more about it at the time and went back to sleep. And across the road, a gentleman visitor, visitor at number 23 saw an extraordinary thing through one of the windows opposite, flitting along his line of vision, something that looked like the figure of a naked man. Perhaps this struck him as amusing at the time, someone else engaged in clandestine nocturnal activities like himself. Though, of course, he wasn't meant to have seen anything, wasn't meant to be in Norfolk Street at all, visiting his married mistress in the middle of the night. He, too, put the incident out of his mind. But at seven in the morning, Henry Lakes, the footman at number 22, was cleaning shoes below stairs when the bell rang furiously. By the time he got up the area steps, the caller had run onto the house next door. It was the housemaid from number 14 screaming at Mr. Latham's man, Daniel Young, about the house being robbed and her master dead. Somehow that night, mayhem and murder had come to their street. Thank you for joining me for this quick book look. I hope you enjoyed it and that you're intrigued to read more. Uh, make sure that you check it out and I will see you next week.